Hey, good morning, Shades. Hey, this morning I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 5. And uh, we're going to look at a number of things today. So if you've got your Bible, I'd like for you to open it. If you've got your Holy Mobile, I'd like for you to open that and put that on 1 Kings chapter 5. We have been in a study of uh, an historical biblical character by the name of Solomon. Solomon was the wisest, richest king leader of Israel they've ever had and actually the wisest, richest that has ever ruled anywhere. It's an amazing individual. And so what we're doing is we're looking at his life as it's talked about in Scripture and then seeing what we can learn from this. And so today, uh, as we've talked in our series, it's like he's a thinker, a builder, a leader, and a king. The thinker, we've talked about wisdom, builder, the building of the temple and the palace. And that covers chapters 5 through 8, chapters 5 through 8, talking about him building the temple and also uh, in the palace. And so I just want to let you know that we're going to cover chapter 5 all the way through the first part of chapter 8. We will do it in 30 minutes, and it will be one of the great, amazing things that you'll see done. Are you ready? We can make this happen. Now, we're calling this uh, Solomon, and uh, we're calling it a reminder Solomon's temple, a reminder. You know, on our phones, we can get on our cell phones an app that is a reminder app to where it will remind us of uh, appointments that we need to make, to-do list, whatever. And you can set it up different ways. You can set it up so it just comes up on your screen. You can set it up so that it makes a beeping noise. You can set it up so that uh, maybe it's a voice, even your voice, that says reminder on so-and-so. You can even set up to where a certain song plays to remind you. So I had a lot of fun uh, this week. I started researching uh, the apps and, uh, and started reading the reviews of those who use them. I think my favorite comment was one of the people who said, it's got the best snooze feature. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I kind of thought that the purpose of a reminder app was to move you towards some kind of action. However, from this person's perspective, hey, I love that snooze feature uh, over here. I can keep putting off, putting off, putting off. Well, I don't want you to use the snooze feature today, okay? But what I want you to do is I want you to think about if you had an app on your phone that was Solomon's Temple. And then if we designed an app to be on the phone that had the temple on there and that when you would access that app, it would come up and give you truths about life for you to remember. So I want you to hold on with what we're going to walk through here and we're going to point out features of that app and what the reminders would be off of what God's Word says about the temple. If you get to chapter 5, when you start in chapter 5, uh, there is a king by the name of Hiram of Tyre. Tyre is over uh, near the Mediterranean. It's where the Phoenicians are. And he's the king. He was a great friend of David, who was Solomon's father. And so he sends his well wishes and his congratulations to Solomon. Solomon comes back to him and says, let me tell you what I'm doing, king. I've got a building project. I'm getting ready to, to build a temple, build a palace. And uh, we need the cedars of Lebanon. I mean, that's the place to go for the best cedars and cypress trees is there in Lebanon. And he says, I'd like to work a business deal with you. If you guys, if you would cut them down, we will take money and pay fair wages for your people. And then not only will you do that, but we'll also send some workers to help you. Hiram came back to him and he said, sounds like a great deal. Tell you what, we're so good, uh, we'll sail them to you. We'll get them cut down, put them, sail them over there, get them to the point where you need to be. And uh, we'll take care of all of that. Look forward to working with you. They shook hands. It was a great business deal. And so what Solomon said is, I'm going to draft 30,000 workers, and I'll take 10,000 at a time, and 10,000 will go and spend a month in Lebanon and come home for two months. we got 10,000 heading to Lebanon, then coming home. Not only do we have 30,000 workers for that, but we got 70,000, they were called burden barriers, 80,000 stone cutters, and 3,300 officials. That's kind of like your foreman, the people that are overseeing all this project. This is one huge project. That is a lot of folks. And so <clears throat> he's got all these people to be able to make this temple become a reality. And so then all of a sudden you get into chapter 6. And when you get into chapter 6, he's telling you we're starting the process. Chapter 6, verse 1 says this. 
In the 480th year, after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. It was his fourth year of reigning, and he says, we're going to start it right now. Lays foundation. They start building it. Well, you go through chapter 6, and it talks about all that they did and all the different things to build it. And then you get to verses 37 and 38. And in 37, 38, it says this. In the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Ziv. And in the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished in all its parts and according to all its specifications. And he was seven years in building it. Seven years. They built the temple in seven years. Now, when you get your temple app, Solomon's temple app, and you go on your phone and you hit Solomon's temple app, first thing that will come up is a picture of the temple. And whenever you see a picture of the temple, here's your first reminder. And the reminder is this, and that is to do everything for the glory of God. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something. For, you're going to have to write these down because the app has not been developed yet. And so if you could write these down, this would be really good, okay? So reminder number one, when you see Solomon's temple, the very first thing you think of, it's a reminder to do everything for the glory of God. A reminder to do everything for the glory of God. Now, we know that because in the uh, Scriptures, in uh, 1 Kings, when they were first starting all of this, uh, this uh, work, when Hiram was talking to Solomon, Solomon said to him in verse 5 of chapter 5, So I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. So I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. What that means is he did not build the temple for political reasons. He did not build the temple for financial reasons to say, hey, it's good for our economy. It'll bring a lot of money in there. He didn't build the temple for his own personal reasons so everybody would look and say, Woo, look at Solomon. Look at what a great guy he is. No, he built the temple for one reason and one reason only, and that was that it would bring glory and honor to the name of the Lord. That was his reason for building it. And so there were many things that Solomon did during his 40 years of reigning. But his first priority was to build the temple for the name of the Lord, and that was his enduring legacy. Everything we do should be for the glory of the Lord. Let this be a reminder to us. Paul talks about this, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Look what he says. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do, you do all for the glory of God. That means your first thought should not be, what is in it for me, but how do I bring glory to God? That next decision you make, that next direction you go, that next, next action you take, that next attitude that you share, your first question is not, what is this going to be about me, but what is it going to be about God? What can I do to bring glory to him? So every time you go on that temple app and you see Solomon's temple, it's the first thing you want to see is that everything I do would be for the glory of God. Okay, well, you get to 1 Kings chapter 7. And, uh, and so when you get to 1 Kings chapter 7, some of you are pretty excited. You're saying, good gracious, he's always, already knocked out chapters 5 and 6, and we've only been like seven minutes. Uh, <laughs> we're going to be out of here early. <laughs> nay, nay. Uh, we, we'll slow it down a little bit, but not too much. All right, we still got a uh, chapter and a half to go. So in chapter 7, you get over to, um, um, to building the palace. Now, let me read you verse 1. It says, Solomon was building his own house 13 years, and he finished his entire house. Now, how long did it take him to build the temple? How many years? Seven years. And now he's building his house. How many years is it taken for his house? 13 years. He has been misquoted, misunderstood for thousands of years, and I'm here to set the record straight, okay? Uh, I'm a Solomon apologist, and uh, everyone says, I can't believe he took 13 years to build his house and seven in the temple. It means he put a lot more time in the temple. Well, actually, when he said he built the, temp uh, the, pa the palace, his house, it was a complex. There was a lot of buildings, not just one house. A number of those buildings are listed in chapter 7, verses 1 through 12. I'm just going to tell you some of the things. So when he's built the temple, then he's also got this huge complex. And in that complex, he's building the palace of the uh, forest of Lebanon. Some people believe that's an armory where they would put their weapons. 
but that's one, one palace. Then he has something called the Hall of Pillars. Then he has something called the Hall of Thrones or the Hall of Judgments, where all the judicial things took place. Then he built his house. Then he built a house for his first wife. Remember, he married Pharaoh's daughter. That was his first wife. And he built her her own house. Listen, when you get 700 wives, the first one's got to get some perk. And so he gave her the perk of her own house on there. Maybe it's after those other wives were added. She didn't want to hang around with Solomon. I don't know. But he built all of that. So when it says 13 years, it was this huge complex that he built and he finished. Well, then all of a sudden you come into verse 13, and from verse 13 to the end of that chapter, it is the furnishings of the temple. It's the furnishings of the temple. And so they're, <clears throat> in verse 13, they introduce you to another man by the name of Hiram from Tyre. This is not King Hiram from Tyre. It's another Hiram, <laughs> same country, different guy. And this guy, he says that he was a worker in bronze. And he was full of wisdom, understanding, and skill for making any work in bronze. And he came to King Solomon and did all his work. This guy named Hiram was the best of the best. Well, he charged a lot of money, but it didn't matter because Solomon was the richest man in the world. So he could pay this guy to come, and he says, do all the furnishings in the temple. And that's what he did. And he was this incredible craftsman of bronze. Well, he's beginning to put all this together. And in the middle of chapter 7, in verse 21, it jumps out and gives you some specificity. Look in verse 21. In chapter 7, verse 21, he says this. He set up the pillars at the vestibule of the temple. And he set up the pillar on the south and called its name Jacob. And he set up the pillar on the north and he called its name Boaz. Now, these were two ornamental pillars. They were not load-bearing. They didn't support the temple because they were a furnishing. And so he put in these, these two, and he named them. One was Jacob, one was Boaz. And the, it was not so much he was naming it after a person. It's what that name meant. Jacob, it meant he establishes. Jacob, he establishes. That means it's the initiative of God. And then he's got the other pillar over here, which is Boaz, and it says, by him is he mighty. By him is he mighty. And that means there's a dependence on God and that the king has to have a dependence on God. So it says that Hiram was full of wisdom and understanding. So he was more than just a craftsman. He had a lot of wisdom. And so when he put these two ornamental pillars up, he named one of them to say, it is the initiative of God. And he's named the other one to say, we're totally dependent on God on there. And so every time that Solomon would come in there, he would see those two. He would remember that this was a task that God gave to Solomon. And then he also says, but you will be dependent on me. And in fact, if you turn back to chapter 6, in the middle of the construction process in the temple, all of a sudden, God comes to uh, Solomon in the middle of the construction. And in verses 11, 12, 13, he says, Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon. Concerning this house that you are building, concerning this house that you are building, this house that I have initiated, this house that you are building, what is supposed to happen? If you will walk in my statutes and obey my rules and keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will establish my word with you, which I spoke to David your father. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Bottom line, you're dependent on God. You just stay dependent on God. He initiates it. He depends it. So, when you get your Solomon Temple app, and you go to your Solomon Temple app, there will be two freestanding pillars. And when you click the two freestanding pillars, this is what they remind you. It's a reminder of God's initiative and our dependence. It's a reminder of God's initiative and our dependence. And it's not just 3,000 years ago, but it is today. We are to be reminded that God is the one that took the initiative to bring us into his family. And so when you think about it, you think about Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And in Romans 5, 8, 
when it talks about that even though while we were yet sinners, what did God do? He demonstrated his love for us. And so he wanted to show us how much he loved us. So while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not a matter of everyone trying to seek God. God is the initiator. He came and sought us. And he saw that he, as a holy God, we as sinful people, we were separated from God. And we could not come into a relationship with him. No matter how many good things we tried to do, we could never ascend and get to the holiness of God. So in his love for us, he initiates a plan of salvation. He sends his son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life on this earth, to show us who the Father is, to go to the cross, die on a cross, three days later, to be raised from the dead, and then to ascend to, to heaven, to be with the Father. And he paid our sins for us. And he offers us this opportunity to come into a right relationship with him, to be adopted into his family. He initiated that. And so when I'm pressing on that app and I see those, those uh, two freestanding pillars over there, I am reminded that God is the one that initiated my salvation. But then on the other one, I'm reminded that I am totally dependent on God. John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus talking to his disciples at, at what we call the Last Supper. This is what he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do, what does it say? Nothing. You can do nothing. So if it says that apart from God I can do nothing, it means that I'm sitting over here at this pillar and I am totally dependent on God. I'm totally dependent on him. And so I think it's great for all of us to be reminded that we are totally dependent on him. By him are you mighty, totally dependent on him. So it's a great reminder. Well, chapter 7, they were furnishing the temple, and you come to chapter 8. And so in 1 Kings chapter 8, in these first 11 verses, there is the dedication of the temple. This is them coming in to the temple. And I want you to see in the first couple of verses, it says in verse 1 and 2, it says, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel, before King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the feast in the month, Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders came. All right. Everybody gathered together. And if you looked real closely, it says that it was the seventh month. Now, if you're really good, you would have heard when I read a verse when the temple was finished that it was completed in the eighth month. So it was completed in the eighth month, they waited 11 months in order to have this celebration. Part of it is it was like an MGA, MGNA checklist. All right, we got to make sure we get everything, no, nah, just kidding, <laughs> got to get everything checked off, you know, to get you into the temple. Now, nah, actually the reason most people believe they waited for 11 months is because that month is when they have the Feast of Booths. And if you remember, if you were here during the summer when we talked about the feast, one of them was the Feast of Booths. And it was a celebration that was held in that month that was a reminder of how God led them through the promised land. And as he led them to the promised land and he guided them and he got them into, uh, led them through the wilderness, excuse me, to get them into the promised land, and they were thankful for that. And they were to praise him because he faithfully guided them through that wilderness, got them into the promised land, showing he was a faithful God, pouring out his blessings on them. And it was a great time for everybody to come together, nationalistic fervor, spiritual fervor. So he was very strategic in planning, let's do it on this particular day. And sure enough, they're setting up. And when they're getting ready to do it, there's some things that they're bringing in the temple. And he says in verses 3 through 4, in verses 3 and 4, he says this. He says, And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. And they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priest and the Levites brought them up. Two main things they brought up. Stick with me. One of it was the old tabernacle. Back when they were, uh, they were in slavery in Egypt, and then they were bringing them out of slavery, and they were going to the wilderness to try to get the promised land. 
God said, I want you to build a tabernacle where we can come and worship. And, uh, and Moses, a place where you can meet with me. And so they built this tabernacle. And it was portable. And so when it was time to move to the next location, they'd pack up the tabernacle and take it with them. Well, over the years, the tabernacle ended up in a city in Gibeon. So it's just sitting there in Gibeon along with all the furnishings. They said, grab it and let's bring it with us. Well, they grabbed it, brought them with it. They didn't have a use for it because now they had a permanent temple. So they were going to store it. So they will store the tabernacle. And all the furnishings, they're going to store the furnishings. Now, the furnishings were like 13th century B.C. The temple is like 10th century B.C. And it just doesn't go with the decor. Okay, uh, I mean, you put those things out and somebody would automatically take a look at it and say, that is so 13th century. And uh, it's just not going to go. It's just, it's just gonna, not going to happen. So, but they were very meaningful, so they stored them some other place. Ah, but they also brought in the Ark of the Covenant. And this is what the whole thing was about. Bringing in the Ark of the Covenant. Ark of the Covenant was built in your Bibles in Exodus 25, when they were first out there in the wilderness, they got the Ten Commandments, and then God said, I want you to build this Ark of the Covenant. It's about four and a third feet uh, long, about two and a half feet wide, and about two and a half feet high. And that's it. It's the Ark of the Covenant. And it represented the presence of God, as if the presence of God had, had descended on that. And it constantly represented his presence. And so for 40 years as they were going through the wilderness, they would take the Ark of the Covenant with them. And whenever they would camp, Ark of the Covenant would be there. Whenever it's time to move, they take the Ark of the Covenant with them. And when it came time for God to, to, sh to show them their next direction, Ark of the Covenant would lead the way. When they were getting ready to go into the promised land, it was, they had to cross the Jordan River, and it was at flood stage, the worst time to cross. But God said, this is when you cross. And Joshua told the people, hey, tell you what, when you see the Ark of the Covenant going forward, you just follow it. And sure enough, priests held on that Ark of the Covenant. They got to the edge of the water. The water began to splend, and they began to just walk on dry land. You follow the Ark of the Covenant. They get into the promised land. They're all excited. They've got Jericho. How are we going to get through Jericho? He says, take the Ark of the Covenant, the priest. You march around it, and you know the story. Go around about seven times, blow the trumpet. Walls came down. Ark of the Covenant leading us on our way. Now, they had it. And the Ark of the Covenant, when it got into the, when they got into the Promised Land, it bounced around between some different places. And, to, and at this time, it was sitting in Jerusalem with a tent. And they said, take it from there and take it all the way up to the temple. They said, okay. So now they're starting. Verse 5. When they get to verse 5, he says this. He says, and King Saul and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. They were sacrificing all these different animals for forgiveness of their sins, forgiveness of the, of the sins of the nation. In verse 6, then the priest brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house and in the most holy place underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark so that the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. And the poles are so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary and they could not be seen from outside and they are there to this day. They took the ark and they placed it in the inner sanctuary into what was called the holy of holies, a place that could only be entered into one day a year by the, by the high priest. Now, let me just show you a picture of what, uh, of what people feel like that the ark of the covenant looks like on that. And this is, this is what it looks like. Now, most of you think that just Indiana Jones was looking for it and that he had found it on there. But we want to let you know, it is really something. It is a real ark of the covenant, not what Indiana Jones uh, and Indiana Jones movie. And uh, now that's what he was searching for, but I don't think he found it. All right, so in this, what you see is the gold overlaid, and then up above it, those are like the cherubim, the angels. And, and as they are there, it is the presence of God sits right in there. And the cherubim, what their job is, is they just worship him. They worship him constantly, and they're at God's service. And so when you look at this and you go on your phone and you go to your Solomon Temple app, you will go and you will see Ark of the Covenant. 
And when you push Ark of the Covenant, here's your reminder. It's a reminder of God's holiness and guiding presence. The Ark of the Covenant is a reminder of God's holiness and guiding presence. Every time you see the Ark, you're to think about God's holiness. Because they had taken that Ark and they placed it in the Holy of Holies. And it is where God himself, his presence was. And so there was a holiness there, and they understood that. But then it's also, I want you to be reminded of his love for you as he guides you. Because when they had the Ark of the Covenant, they said, you just follow it. And the cloud of the Lord will lead, and the Ark of the Covenant will lead. And we're going to guide you through this wilderness. And this is something that every one of us needs to know. That whether you're walking through your wilderness, or whether you're having the greatest times of your life, God is guiding and leading and is always there with you needs to be a reminder he is a holy God but he is also a guiding presence and he will guide you through directions decisions that you need to make in your life what are my next steps God says I will give you that guidance that you need well they put the uh, ark of the covenant in there well the question is is there anything inside of the ark glad you asked look what it says in verse 9 verse 9 it says this It says that uh, there was nothing in the ark except for the two tablets of stone that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. There were two tablets. What do you think those tablets were? We call them what? Ten Commandments. You saw the movie. All right. Uh, They called the Ten Commandments and the Ten Commandments that God had given them. So when you go on your app, And you go on your Solomon Temple app, and when you hit it, you're going to see Ten Commandments. When you push the Ten Commandments, here's your reminder. It is a reminder of how we are to respond to God's grace. The Ten Commandments are a reminder of how we are to respond to God's grace. You see, it's interesting that when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, it was in in, uh, Exodus 20, when he gave the Ten Commandments, If you take the book of Exodus all the way through the book of Deuteronomy, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those books in the Old Testament that leading up to the death of Moses, 26 times the Lord says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. 26 times he reminded them, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And so when he reminds them of that, he says, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Here are Ten Commandments. And when he gave those Ten Commandments, we are not to obey those commandments out of a fear of God, but we are to obey those out of love and gratitude. Because he says, hey, Danny, I took you out of slavery, brought you into freedom because I love you. Now, I'm going to give you ten things right here. And these ten things are not to suck the joy out of your life. But these are rules for living that provide a pathway to a life of purpose, a life of significance, and a life that will glorify God for bringing you out of slavery and into freedom. When you look at obeying God and you look at just taking the Ten Commandments, we do this because we're responding to God's grace and because he has given us the opportunity to go out of captivity and into freedom. The Ten Commandments. And let me give you a sub-point reminder on that. It is a reminder to make God's values our priorities in every endeavor of life. When you go on that app and you hit the Ten Commandments, not only does it talk about responding to God's grace, but it also is a reminder to make God's values our priorities in every endeavor of life. Solomon, in the midst of building a temple, he's in a building program of all things, and God comes to him and he says, hey, just want to remind you to walk in my statutes and to obey my commandments. Just want to remind you of that. And that means that we're to value God's, we're to, to take God's values as our priorities, okay, in every endeavor of life. Whether you're building the temple, whether you're building a business, whether you're raising a family, whether you're teaching a class, or you're just navigating through teenage years, you are to make God's values your priorities in every endeavor of life, okay? 
And last of all, verses 10 through 11, just when you say, well, Danny, that's the highlight. The Ark of the Covenant has come in. We, we, that's it. Oh, no. Whoa. They saved the best for last. Look, verse 10. In verse 10, it says, and when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house. The most glorious thing that just took place is the cloud of the Lord filled this house. Now, what it said is the priest walked in, and they put the ark in there, and they're getting everything set up. And then all of a sudden, the cloud came in, and it was so thick, so heavy, they had to step out and get out. They had to get out, out of there. And when you think about chapters 5 through 7, the splendor of this incredible temple and all the things they've done, it meant nothing until the presence of the Lord came in. If the presence of the Lord didn't come in, it's like a house uh, without an inhabitant. It's like a body without a soul. It really would have meant nothing. But what gave it its greatest significance was when the glory of the Lord came in and filled the temple. So when you go on that app, Solomon's Temple, and you hit it, one of the things that will come up is it will be the cloud, okay? And look what it says about the cloud. It's a reminder of the Lord's glory and is never changing character, the cloud. It's a reminder of the Lord's glory and his never changing character. When it filled the temple, when this cloud filled the temple, it confirmed that God would indeed condescend to bless this house that Solomon had built in his name. And it let him know that, yes, I will bless this. And it also pointed out his never-changing character. And the reason I say that is that, you remember I talked about the tabernacle? When they built the tabernacle in Exodus, as soon as they built it, look what happened. See if it sounds familiar. In verse Exodus 40, verses 33 through 35, it says, So Moses finished the work. And then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord (coughs) filled the tabernacle. Wow. So just as God was with Moses, so God is with this new generation. Because, you know, some of the people could be sitting there and saying, well, man, I wish it was be like it was when Moses' day, when... uh, when we knew that God had his hand on us. But does he still have his hand on us today? Is he still blessing us today? He said, yeah. That same glory of the Lord just filled this temple that we just built. His character never changes. And that means he desires to have fellowship with us and an ongoing commitment to love us, to save us, and to guide us. That never changes. Never changes. There is no God of the Old Testament, God of the New Testament, God of today. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His character never changes. The same God that loved you when you were just as low as you could be is the same God that loves you when you're standing at the pinnacle of success. It doesn't change. And the same God that loved you when you were crying out for forgiveness of your sins is the same God that loves you when you've kind of got your life heading right. And then when you get down into a pit, it's the same God that still loves you. It's his never-ending character. It's going to continue. And so when you go to the app and you look on there and you see the cloud, you are to be constantly reminded of the Lord's glory and also of his never-changing character. But here's the last thing. And that is when you look at that cloud, you got a second reminder. And the reminder is that we are being transformed into the image of Christ. A reminder that we are being transformed into the image of Christ. So when you see that cloud, the glory of the Lord that has filled this temple, you need to understand that we are being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that uh, our bodies are the temple of God. And when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, His Holy Spirit comes in and to reside in your temple, (laughs) in your body. And as He resides in your body, there is transformation that begins to to take place. If you look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. 
unveiled faces. That means there's nothing separating us from seeing, uh, seeing God and his seeing salvation. And then he says, we behold the glory of the Lord. And as we behold the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the image of Christ. And as we are being transformed into the image of Christ, we then reflect that to other people. So that when people see us, they don't see Danny Wood, but hopefully they see Jesus Christ through Danny Wood. Same thing with you. Any believer, put your name right in there. That's what the what the goal is, is for us to be able to be transformed into the image of Christ and so reflect who he is. When you go on the app and you see that cloud and you check that, it's going to be a reminder that your life, you are constantly being transformed into the image of God. Wow. It's a great reminders. Great reminders about our lives and about the truths of what God's word says. But you know... I couldn't think of a better way for us to close our service than to do what Jesus said, that when he had that last supper with his disciples, he says, do this in remembrance of me. I want you to remember me and remember the love I have for you and what I've done for you by going to a cross and then being raised from the dead. And so tonight, today, we're going to participate as we close out our service in the Lord's Supper. And so uh, I'm going to ask our ushers to uh, go on and begin to get in their place. And let me give you some explanation here, the Lord's Supper. Jesus had a dinner with his disciples on the night of his arrest before he was going to be crucified that next morning. And as he met with them at dinner, there were some significant things that took place at that dinner. And, uh, and he took some of the elements and gave new meaning to them and then asked us to be able to do this again in remembrance of him. And so when we take this Lord's Supper, it is something that is for believers only. That means those who've made a decision for Christ, been born again, adopted in the family, you've made a decision as Jesus to come into your heart. And, and if, if you're here, you're not a member of Shades, but yet you are a believer, uh, you can partake of the Lord's Supper. You, you may not be a Baptist. You may not even be from Alabama. You should be, but let's say if you're not. If you're not from uh, the state or whatever, you're a visitor and you're a believer, you partake in this. You're part of the family. And there's some of you, just being real honest, you may say, Danny, hey, I appreciate it. I've really enjoyed what we've done today, but I'm really not a believer. I, I'm not, I really haven't, haven't made that decision. Man, that's fine. What we would ask for you is that when the plate comes, that you just go on and pass it to the next person. And that you be thinking about the things that we've talked about and also the significance of, of what this represents. And it's our hope that, that God would speak to your heart and, uh, and encourage you to make that decision to come in that relationship with him. So I want to lead us in a word of prayer. After I do that, we'll distribute the elements and you just hold on and I'll give you instructions for how we partake. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for this day and this opportunity for us to be able to um, partake of the Lord's Supper and to do this in remembrance of you. We're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for what he's done on the cross and thankful that you raised him from the dead and that uh, you give us that offer of salvation. And so now during this time, let us have a sweet time of remembrance. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.